This is part two of the First Corinthians overview. And we got done with chapter six. We're going to start with chapter seven. And what you have in chapter seven is the greatest chapter on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. If you want to know about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, you come to First Corinthians 7 and verse 2. <clears throat> says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Notice that one of the main reasons to get married is to avoid fornication. <clears throat> and if you can't remain single without living in a lustful state, then you should get married. It says in verse 3, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that may you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Notice the body of one spouse belongs to the other spouse it says defraud ye not one the other some married couples deprive each other of the marriage bed and it's a sin to do to do that it says in hebrews thirteen four, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled uh, marriage is a good thing the privileges you have in marriage is a good thing defraud ye not the other he says in verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So Paul says to the people that are unmarried and to the widows, those that have lost their husband, he says, you know, it's good if you abide even as I. Paul was single. He said it is good for them if they abide even as him. If you can stay single, then it gives more of an opportunity to serve the Lord. When you're single, you think, well, this is a bad thing. However, you're actually in a situation that a good portion of married couples wish that they were in. You have all these married people who wish that they were single. And that's awful that they wish they were single. But still, being single is not a bad thing. If you can serve God single, then you have more time to serve God. When you have a wife and kids and all those responsibilities of being a husband and father, which those aren't bad things... It takes hours away from spending time in the book, in prayer, in your ministry. So, I mean, if you've got a wife and kids, you know, that's a great thing. If you're single, that's a great thing because you got more time to spend with all the stuff that you need to do. 1 Corinthians 7, 9 says, But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. I believe for most people it is a necessity that they get married because they won't be able to contain. Uh, Paul said it's better to marry than to burn, and he's referring to burning in your lust. If you can remain single without being overtaken by lust, then you have a unique gift. Now, I don't have that gift. I need a wife. I've personally never met anyone with that gift, and I can't really even think of any examples outside of the Apostle Paul. Paul could go through his Christian life he didn't need a wife. He never had a lust problem, it doesn't seem like. However, at the same time, while you're searching for a spouse, don't see this as a bad time. Use your free time and lack of responsibility to pour yourself, pour yourself into the Bible. And then turn the Bible upside down and pour it into you and then repeat. Now, I do that every day anyway. But if I was single with no wife or kids, which I don't want to be, then I'd probably have an extra 40 hours a week in the Bible, if not more than that. It says in 1 Corinthians 7.10, And unto the married I command, Yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So if you have a husband, stay with him. But it says in verse 11, But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Paul is saying that even if you have a husband or wife that is lost, that believeth not, if they will stay married to you, then you shouldn't divorce them. This is the case for many Christian women. They're in a marriage with an unbelieving man. 
And the best advice to give them is the Bible's advice. If you are married to a lost man, just keep living for God and he can be won over by your chaste conversation. As it says in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 5, it tells you what to do if you're a lost, if you're a saved woman married to a lost man. It says, who's adorning, let it not be the, or let me start in verse 1. Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. He can be won over by how you're living. It says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of playing the hair or of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. So just keep serving God, being good to your husband, even though he doesn't deserve it, and maybe you can win him over. The lost husband can be won over by the way of life of the saved wife. And it says in 1 Corinthians seven thirteen and 14, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So for the sake of the saved spouse, God honors the marriage, and the children that come from the marriage are sanctified as well. And this is not meaning they're saved. I mean, you're not saved because one of your parents are saved. A man isn't saved just because his wife is saved. God honors the marriage for the sake of the saved person and honor, honors the children for the sake of the saved spouse. And you should take comfort in that if you're say, a saved person married to a lost person. Just like it said in that verse in Hebrews, marriage is honorable in all and the, and the bed undefiled. So if you're saved and he's lost, God honors the marriage for your sake. In 1 Corinthians seven fifteen, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. So if your spouse departs, then you're no longer in bondage to them and you're free to remarry. If your spouse just ups and leaves you, I mean, you don't have to be in bondage the rest of your life. It wouldn't be a sin for you to remarry. There was nothing wrong you did. They're the one that left. Notice it says, if the unbeliever departs. So the question arises, what if a believing spouse departs? Are you in bondage and just have to remain single or, and, or have to go without a spouse? Well, if you try every way to reconcile and they won't, then you can count them as an unbeliever. Just like in Matthew eighteen fifteen through 17, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If, she, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then <clears throat> take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear thee, to he hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. If he, if he neglects to hear anybody out, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. You can count him as an unbeliever. He may be saved, but you can count him as an unbeliever. When you talk like I'm talking, though, people think that I'm all about a quick divorce. It's not that. I just believe that God understands that this happens and he doesn't... He's not going to force you to just remain single the rest of your life because your spouse left you and it wasn't your fault. I never said you have to get a divorce. I never said you have to remarry. Even if your spouse, uh, spouse cheats on you, you can still stick it out. People have, and they do many times stick it out and remain married to that person. I'm saying that there are three occasions where 
the Bible says it's okay to divorce and remarry. I mean, if your spouse commits fornication, you're free to be divorced and remarried, and there's no sin on your part. I'm not saying you have to. I'm not saying that I would. I'm saying that in Matthew 5, 32, that's what it says. If your spouse deserts you, in 1 Corinthians seven fifteen, if they depart, you're not under bondage in such cases. And obviously, if they die, you're you're loosed from them, and it's not wrong to remarry. Everybody believes that one. But you have a lot of preachers who believe that if a woman leaves a husband against his will, that he must stay single until the woman dies. So say you're 20 years old, your wife just finds another man, leaves you tomorrow. They say you got to remain single until that woman dies. So even if he's 20 years old, imagine having to stay single for 60 years or better because your wife left you or left you for another man. And when you tell, you know, when you tell someone that you are, that you have to remain single until your spouse dies, all you're doing is binding heavy burdens that are grievous to be born. It's very pharisaical. It's like in Matthew 23, 4, it says, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So a young 20-year-old guy is going to have to walk around burning in lust for the next 40 years or until death because some Baptist preacher told him that it would be a sin for him to remarry, even though there was never any uncleanness on his part. Imagine being a 20-year-old in 2021 where he can't even go to that same church without seeing a woman uh, letting it all hang out or with her clothes so tight you can see everything she's got. I mean, he's going to be doing the opposite of what Paul said not to do, burning in lust. And then uh, the self-righteous pastor, who has a good wife, is up there telling him that he must remain single and that he's sinning if he remarries, even though he's not the one that wanted a divorce. It's not his fault his wife left him. It's not his fault that his wife cheated on him. It's easy for the guy behind the pulpit to say all that when he's got a good wife that does everything he says. But I just, it's like when people talk that way, it's like what planet do they live on anyway? It's like they've got lost in their own, they may be a, it may be a good man, a good godly man, but it's like he's living in this other world that God's not even, God's not even said any of this stuff he's saying. Where does it say that you, how is it saying that you must remain single the rest of your life until your wife dies? Now, if you're the one leaving your spouse, that's cheated on your spouse, that, that wants the divorce for even, or for just no reason, then yeah, that's, you're an, an adulterer. But the person who's been doing what they're supposed to do has been married to this person. They've been faithful. Uh, they're not wanting a divorce. They're not leaving. That person did nothing wrong. And when you tell them that they have to remain single the rest of their life, it's like you're telling them that they did wrong, when it actually it was their spouse that did wrong. 1 Corinthians seven twenty seven: Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. So if you're bound as in married, then don't seek, seek to be unmarried. Um, if you're loose from a wife, don't seek a wife. If you are divorced, then say you're in a situation where you are divorced. You're, maybe your wife divorced you or something. Just stay single if you can. Maybe you can't, but if you can, stay single. You'll have more time to serve God. 1 Corinthians seven twenty eight. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. You see, if you're loosed, then you can remarry, and you've not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you. So if divorce has hit your life for scriptural reasons, such as 
they stepped out on you, they deserted you, or they died, then if you do remarry, you haven't sinned, but you will have trouble in the flesh. It says in verse 39, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Notice that phrase, only in the Lord. It should be a priority to marry a saved person. I understand that maybe they tricked you somebody could trick you maybe you maybe you weren't saved yourself when you got married maybe you weren't right with god maybe you were saved but not right with god when you got married you end up married a lost person maybe you ended up falling in love with the lost person i understand it's a very common thing for a woman to be married to a lost man and i gave you the bible advice for what you should do in that situation and i understand completely that it happens but for those who aren't in that situation Make it a priority to marry a Christian who acts like a Christian. Now, chapter 8. You got food offered to idols and not making your brother to offend. Is what this chapter is going to be about. In 1 Corinthians 8, 1, it says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Notice that knowledge puffs you up. A man can get puffed up in his knowledge, meaning he can start to get full of himself because of how much he knows. It is actually charity that edifies. I mean, you can give people everything in your brain and transfer all your knowledge to them, but if you don't have charity when you do it, then it's not edifying. People aren't so much concerned with how much you know, how much you can tell them. They're concerned with how much do you care about them. The average person that comes into a church isn't concerned with how much Bible you know. They're concerned with, did you shake their hand? Did you ask about their sick loved one? Did you seem like you love them as, as you teach or preach whatever you're doing? All these things like that. They aren't concerned with how much you know. They really want to know if you care about them or not. And it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 2, If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. If we think we know a lot, then we really know nothing. Any time that I'm trying to teach someone the Bible, they show how little they know when they think that they no already know what I'm telling them. Uh, my time is spent uh, in the Bible every day, many, many hours a day, and I still feel like I know nothing. I think believing that I know nothing is one of the things that keeps me in the book. I think the day that people start thinking they know enough, they reach a point where they think, well, I know about that topic, I know about this topic, I know about that book. That's when they stop growing and they just stay. I mean, they may know quite a bit compared to everybody else, but then they just stay, they just stop growing. I'm waiting for the day that I'll feel like I know something, but it's not. It's never coming, I hope. If, if 1 Corinthians 8, 3, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. You may have a lot of knowledge, but can people see you love God in the Bible? It says in 8, 4, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered and sacrificed unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. Me and you know that an idol is nothing. It can't see, it can't hear, it can't walk. Me and you know that there is just one God. But the idol is a statue, a toy, made of wood, plastic, metal, whatever it is. It says in verse 5, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. There are a lot of little G gods, but there is only one big G God. But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Albeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. We may know these things, but there is not in every man that knowledge. If they saw Paul eating meat that had been offered to an idol, then it can mess them up. They see him eat it, He's a spiritual man, so they think, okay, I'll eat it too. However, when when they eat it, they see it as meat offered to an idol. They don't see it as just meat. Uh, they can't do it with faith. Their conscience bugs them about it. 
and they end up stumbling because of it. 1 Corinthians 8.8 8, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. It's just meat. It doesn't make you better or worse. But, verse 9 says, Take heed lest any man, lest by any means, this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. You have liberty to do a lot of things. A lot of things that you have liberty to do are seen as a sin by others. Therefore, if they see you do it, it can cause them to stumble. So even though this certain particular thing may not be a sin, if your brother sees it as a sin, then don't do it where he can see you. It says, For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So Paul's saying he's got liberty to do certain things, but he's not going to abuse that liberty and do it in front of somebody that he can cause to stumble. I mean, this could be all kinds of different things. A big thing is uh, some people uh, are very concerned about uh, you wearing certain things to church. They think if you do not wear a suit and tie to church, that that's not godly, that it's sinful. Now, you can't find that in the Bible anywhere. Uh, and when you look at the people in the Bible... Uh, it doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't say anything about Sunday best. I mean, I just, I don't see how you can say that a person has to wear certain types of clothes to church. Now, the Bible talks about the attire of an harlot. It talks about uh, being modest, things like that. You don't want to wear clothes that make make people lust. But in terms of wearing a suit and tie... You're not going to find that. Jesus didn't wear a suit and tie. John the Baptist didn't wear it. And Moses and Elijah, when they come back in the tribulation, they you don't see them with a suit and tie. <clears throat> and I just don't see how... Like I've heard of preachers even say that they won't listen to a preacher that's, that's not wearing a suit and tie. That is absolutely crazy. It's not about what he's wearing. It's about what's coming out of his mouth. What's the message he's got? What's the, what Bible is he using? Is he using the words of God or no? There's some preachers that would rather listen to a man use an NIV if he's got a suit and tie on than they would a guy who's got a polo shirt on using the King James with the right message. You see, when you start being like that, you're getting into tra tradition stuff. Now, there's nothing wrong with wearing a suit and tie. It's just you can't force everybody to do that when it's not in the Bible. That's your own personal conviction. But at the same time, say that uh, you're some a pastor invited you to preach at his church and he's big on the suit and tie stuff, just go ahead and wear it. I mean, he was nice enough to have you come preach there and he thinks it's wrong to not wear a suit and tie when you're behind the pulpit, just wear it so you don't make your brother too offend. Or some, uh, I know some people uh, are against men wearing shorts because that's they say that's showing your nakedness. But we see in the Bible that as long as the thigh is covered, you're not showing your nakedness. So actually, it's it's not wrong to wear shorts. But I mean, if you know people... If you got a brother in the Lord that is against you wearing shorts and you know it, then just don't wear shorts around him. Because, I mean, but I mean, the Bible it says, you know, it's the thigh. When you uncover the thigh, that's when it's showing your nakedness. <clears throat> but there's all kinds of little things like that. You got liberty to do certain things, but you don't want to abuse that liberty and cause somebody to stumble now chapter 9 it says the it's going to talk about the preacher is worthy of receiving carnal things but don't be in the ministry just for what you can get 
1 Corinthians 9, 9 says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth not God take care for oxen? If you don't pay the preacher, then it's like putting a muzzle in the mouth of the ox so that he can't eat a little bit of the corn. So a lot of people don't think a pastor or evangelist or someone like that is worthy of being paid to preach the gospel, but the Bible says they are, and there's a balance to it. He should be paid, but he shouldn't live like a rock star and just do, do all this for the money he can get. 1 Corinthians 9, 10, and 11, Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Paul is saying that if he's given you these spiritual things, he's preached the gospel to you, given you the mysteries and so on, then isn't that worthy of reaping their carnal things? That is, they should give him some material things to, to help him just continue to get by in this life in exchange for his preaching and the spiritual things he's given them. It says, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul has the power to demand material things for ministering to them spiritually, but he says he hasn't used this power, but suffers all things, because he doesn't want them to think that he's in it for the money. So he suffers not having certain things that would help him just continue to live here in this life. He says, Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So it's good and right to pay the preacher, but a preacher shouldn't just preach because he wants to get paid. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, this is 924, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. The Christian life is like running a race, so run if you want to obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So the athletes work hard, they train, and everything else to obtain corruptible crowns. They work to obtain corruptible rings and trophies. We work to obtain crowns that can't corrupt. If I ever earn a crown at the judgment seat of Christ, then it won't corrupt and it cannot be stolen. Paul says in 926, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. So Paul fights, but not as one that beateth the air. He isn't getting in physical fights like a boxer. He's getting in spiritual battles. And he says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul brings his body into subjection. He doesn't live under the control of, of things like alcohol or cigarettes or food or anything like that. His body was in subjection to him. In chapter 10, in chapter 10, Paul talks about the importance of Old Testament examples and pictures. He says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So he doesn't want you to be ignorant of the things in the Old Testament. Notice the Red Sea crossing here. That's what this is referring to. Is, it's called a baptism. And the water never actually touched them. So this is proof that, all, not, that not all baptisms in the Bible have to do with water says in verse 3 and 4, And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drink of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The things and stories you read in the Old Testament are pictures of something in the New Testament. And that rock that water sprang forth from was a picture of the rock, Jesus Christ. You see, it's all a picture of something in the New Testament. And we learn from the examples and pictures that we read back there. It says in verse 5, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So those things back there are our examples. 
Now he says in verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So anytime temptation arises, you should look for a way out. How many times have you tried to pray a thing out before you went through with the action? When you went off at work on someone, you, you went down their throat, was it after a 30-minute prayer meeting with God in your mind or after a 30-minute temper tantrum that played out in your mind? When you did that, you never looked for an escape sign. When you go off on somebody, that shows you probably didn't pray for 30 minutes before you decided what you were going to do. 1 Corinthians 10:14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. There are some things to run from, and you won't be considered a chicken for doing it. Flee from idolatry idolatry flee fornication there are some things that it makes sense to run from 